Welcome everyone. We're just waiting for folks to get settled in. We'll start in just about one more minute. All right, thank you very much. I'm gonna um, just quickly introduce myself. I'm Maya Hayden. I am an environmental scientist with the USGS um, and I am at the Pacific Coastal and Marine Science Center um, based in California and I lead our stakeholder engagement and outreach for the center. And I'm gonna pass this over to my colleague, Don Kotowitz to take it away. Thanks for joining us. Um, Don, you're muted. Thank you, Maya, and welcome to everyone. Um, I would like to introduce myself. I am Don Codwitz, um, a social science researcher with the USGS, and the US Geographical Survey, or USGS, supports coastal communities by providing scientific information, products, and tools to help our nation mitigate and prepare for coastal hazards. Our coastal science navigator is a gateway to make it easier for potential users to find and access this science. So I will just go through our um, plan for the webinar. First, we will go through introductions um, and then we'll pro provide an overview of the navigator and its development, followed by a demo of the navigator in action and then finally, we'll have a question and answer session. And this is really a chance for you to learn about the Navigator and to ask the um, team some question, any questions you might have. And this effort really represents a cross-disciplinary approach, as you'll see um, as we introduce ourselves. Uh, this is really an effort that involved research centers from across the country, and you'll hear from many of the people who've helped to bring it to this point. Um, the, our primary speaker and uh, person driving the demo will be Erica Lentz, based in Woods, Hole, in Woods Hole at the Coastal and Marine Science Center there. You're also, during the um, Q&A session, you'll be hearing from other steering committee members. And our facilitators today are Maya Hayden, who introduced herself at the outset. She's at the Pacific Coastal and Marine Science Center. Myself, I'm based at St. Petersburg Coastal and Marine Science Center. And um, Amanda Stoltz will be facilitating the Q&A at the end. And she is also based at the Pacific Coastal and Marine Science Center. So Erica Lentz is a research geologist that leads research exploring how coastal change varies among different ecosystems and across landscapes, what makes certain locations more resilient than others, and where coastal change is most likely to occur in the future. She's also interested in the communication of scientific information to support decision-making and uses design thinking and transdisciplinary approaches to deeply consider user needs in the development of products and tools, as well as to foster creativity and innovation in research teams. And with that, I will turn it over to Erica. Thank you, Don. Um, thank you, Maya, and thank you to all of you for tuning in for this to the webinar today. Um, it's thrilling to have this kind of turnout. It is um, even more thrilling to see all of the states that were captured at the outset um, of folks that are attending. Um, and we know that um, many of you may have been um, users that were queried at various parts uh, points in this process, and um, we are really grateful to your input that has helped result in. Um, the uh, gateway that we are going to introduce today. So without further ado, you might be wondering at this point, what 
the Coastal Science Navigator is. Uh, we've been talking about it, um, but um, what does what does an online gateway mean? Um, because really, what this was was an effort to better connect um, users uh, with our coastal science products, tools, and information, um, and make that information more discoverable. There are two fun, uh, there are two uh, functions um, within the navigator. There's a guided search function which takes you through um, three uh, short questions that can help to direct you to the information that you might be looking for, as well as a filtered search function for those that might have some sense of what they're looking for um, and might want to winnow things down through a series of topics or criteria. Um, every product that's in the navigator includes uh, a comprehensive product summary uh, with uh, the search criteria indicated, um, contact information, uh, related products, as well as a linkage directly to the product uh, that's featured. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, users and stakeholders were involved in the creation process and prototype testing uh, for the navigator. Um, which is um, really uh, something we're quite proud of um, because what we employed here was a human-centered design process. Um, so the, the foundation of human-centered design is really that human needs and desires are at the center, at, at the center of the problem and where you start. Um, there's, there's a statement at the bottom of the slide that says, understanding the people for whom you design is the foundation for the approach. Um, and that is very much something that we used um, in this. Um, there are five different phases within human-centered design. There's a discovery phase, which uh, requires a deep understanding of this challenge. And often that requires talking to people um, and deeply considering your users, listening to them, hearing what their day-to-day um, -day is like, what their constraints are, what their challenges are, so that you have a better understanding of, of their, uh, their needs uh, as you go into something. From there, you're synthesizing that information, um, and, and grouping it together so that you can better define the problem that you're trying to solve. Um, you're brainstorming around different ideas that might pro provide solutions to those problems. You're developing early prototypes that aren't refined, that you're testing. Sometimes these are just ideas and scribble scratches, but soliciting that input early and often so that you can course correct and really tailor something to make sure that you're on target. Um, and then the testing um, allows you to continue to refine that um, and improve your solution. Design in general um, is a great way to, um, as we say at the top of the slide, manage the ambiguity that can come from something big like this. Uh, this was a transdisciplinary effort, as has been highlighted already. It involved a large group of people, um, and we were trying to really understand the problem and, and what we were designing for. Um, and it, it provided us internally some necessary structure as well as externally helping us to better frame the problem. The guiding question in this approach uh, that we really used um, to center us was uh, asking who needs what data in what format to make what decisions. So understanding that who primarily and then the what's that followed was really uh, central to um, how we got started. This was a social science exercise. Amanda Stoltz, who you'll meet on the call later, uh, led this effort um, and conducted a lot of um, and, and really structured um, some listening sessions to learn more and learn more deeply um, about what those coastal data needs were. Um, but before she could talk to people, we had to winnow things down a little bit further and really identify who um, our potential users were. Um, we're listing five right here, which includes state planners, local planners, resource managers, consultants, and other researchers. This is actually a fairly long list of um, user targets, um, but because many of these um, users had complementary um, needs, uh, we felt like this list was um, was 
something that we could work with. Um, and the other reason these folks are on the list is because these are folks that typically we uh, knew either used USGS data and needed better ways to access or discover it, um, or uh, we're missing um, access to some of our, uh, our coastal data. Um, and it would be really important for them um, to have a resource uh, where they could better um, access that information. So from there, the listening sessions were conducted. So we identified those targets and then 10 qualitative listening sessions were conducted. Uh, 48 people were spoken to um, by our social scientists. Um, each, each session was really neat. They were designed to include people with the same role from across different regions. So this became an exercise in us not just learning from that target audience type and it, that um, the, the listening session was designed around, but it was also a networking opportunity for those participating in the listening sessions to better understand what others in, in similar roles in different parts of the country might be experiencing. So it deepened and enriched the conversation and the information that we could learn about um, for folks in these roles. Each session was two hours long, resulting in about 21 hours of um, collected data that were then professionally transcribed um, and coded using social science techniques. Um, this report will um, post a URL link to the end. Uh, it's live as of today, which is very exciting. It's great when the timing um, of these things all works out so well. Um, so this was our discovery phase. This was the deep listening phase that uh, was important. And from there comes synthesis, um, where we uh, were able to, from these data, uh, understand that there were four main barriers among this, these target audiences to our coastal data use. The first, too many tools. There were, uh, uh, users were often overwhelmed with a sea of tools um, that were looked like they might fit their needs, but it was really hard to surf this universe and understand where to start. Um, it really is overwhelming. Decision support tools um, are abundant, um, especially in the coastal realm. Um, and this has in and of itself become its own problem. Uh, there was a lack of capacity um, component to a lot of our um, target users. Um, so um, often some of these folks were um, a staff of few or maybe even one um, and trying to learn, find, um, and adopt uh, new workflows around new tools that might be relevant to their decision-making needs was something beyond um, what they could support. Um, and that's where the data access and navigation components became really important. Where was that space where they could get better access and understand how to get to the information that they needed and then once they found it how to apply it because there's a lot of data out there and information out there that looks relevant but then figuring out how to actually use it um, can be its own challenge so what we um, landed on is that um, as we were entering our own ideation phase in the human-centered design process is that a data curator or a navigator uh, would be something that could address many of these barriers. So the navigator itself, you'll see um, in a few moments, is fairly simple. Um, it's simple in its uh, in the data that are supported by it, in its front end design, and in its back end as well. Um, this allowed us to stay iterative, reactive, and open to change, particularly as we built our early prototypes, solicited feedback from folks um, on the functionality and usability of um, those prototypes, um, and allowed us to keep um, adapting it and changing it to make sure that what we resulted in was really targeted and tailored to the need at hand. Um, you see our developer has put um, the keep it simple stupid principle uh, down below, uh, which is uh, is where we were operating from. Um, simplicity what worked in our favor in this case. Um, from there, we tested it. 
um, and we tested it um, quite a bit. We tested it internally, as I mentioned, and as Don mentioned, this was a large cross-center um, group that was working in this space, um, and we had some ready testers at hand that really helped us to evaluate the functionality um, and intuitiveness of the prototypes that we were developed. From there, we conducted one-on-one -on -one usability interviews with um, seven external users. Um, maybe you're on this call right now. If you are, thank you. Um, and these were um, really, uh, we used a contextual inquiry process here um, where we were really asking open-ended questions and trying to observe users in their normal environment. So a lot of this was uh, through video. Um, and having folks narrate their way through uh, barriers that they were encountering, surprises that they were finding as they experimented with the navigator, um, as well as things that worked really well. Um, the reason we landed on seven is that a lot of the usability literature suggests that 85% um, of your problems will be found through um, the testing of just uh, five users. So we felt like seven was a good healthy number to start with. We also had the opportunity to do some further user testing at the February 2023 Coastal Geotools Conference in um, South Carolina, um, where we were able to actually set up a demonstration uh, and have users interact with the tool in real time um, and gather further feedback. Um, with our social scientists observing uh, during that time. So with all of that, I think we're ready for a demo. So I'm going to change gears for a moment and share my window to the navigator. And if somebody could confirm on the team that you can see uh, my screen. Yes, we can see it. And you, you could just zoom in a little bit. That'd be helpful. OK, um, I think I'm I zoomed in. There you as go. That's be. great. OK, That's great. great. Thank you. OK, thank you. OK, so welcome to the Coastal Science Navigator. OK, um, as you're entering the space, you'll see a toolbar on the top um, or a navigation space on the top that um, shows you that we are on the home page right now. Um, it um, brings you directly to the guided search um, element of the navigator, the filtered search as well. There's an about page and uh, a feedback page where um, you can uh, provide feedback as uh, you experience the tool um, and share with us any barriers or challenges or things that um, are working particularly well for you. Um, let's click on the about page for just a moment. Um, when we go to the about page, uh, we learn uh, more what the navigator is about. Um, it includes a little bit more in, about our coastal change hazards focus. Um, it has a direct link to the listening session report uh, that I was mentioning earlier, where um, all of the where the foundation of the data or foundation of the navigator is based, um, as well as um, the project page uh, for the project that supported this. Um, and as we've mentioned, it's a large group that was participating. Uh, there's a main steering committee that's part of this process, many of whom are on this call. These are links to their staff profile pages. You can also see that um, there is um, a place to directly link to the feedback form, as well as um, a general email address that will go to all of us um, if you do have feedback you'd like to share with us directly. If I click on the feedback form, um, it's a fairly straightforward form that will um, guide you through um, and help to um, categorize uh, where um, issues uh, you might be encountering are so that we can fold them into our um, development and refinement process. Um, so let's go back to the home page for a moment um, because um, I forgot to tell you the best part, which is this is the place to discover the USGS coastal data and products that you might need. Um, and you can see there's a guided search button down here as well as a filtered search button here. Um, and those are true also on the um, overview bar. So I'm going to go into the guided search for a moment and show you how this all works. Um, and uh, I learn here that the guided search can help you find the data that you need, even if you're not sure exactly what you're looking for. Um, and there are a series of questions to guide you. 
Um, now, I might be busy and I might not want to answer a lot of questions, but I see as I enter the guided search that there are only um, three questions in total, and uh, maybe I have time for that. Um, and the first makes sense. Um, it's asking about geographic locations that I might be interested in. I see here that there are 55 available products uh, within the navigator that match these filtering criteria. Um, it's also important to note that the results will include national products that cover the selected regions, but some nat national products may not cover every region um, that have the potential to support the full United States and its territories. So that's good information to know. So let's just experiment for a moment. Um, I'm from the East Coast, so I'm going to click on the East Coast um, indicator, and I can see by selecting just the East Coast, I've already winnowed things down to about 28 products that are going to match the criteria um, of the search. If I were to include the West Coast and the Gulf of Mexico, for example, the, the entire continental U.S., um, I get um, at those numbers increase with time. But for now, um, and for the purposes of the demo, let's just stay focused on the East Coast. I'm going to go to the next question. This is question two of three, which is asking me about what topics I might be focused on. So for my purposes today, um, I'm really interested in coastal processes, but I could also choose to skip this question if I didn't know. I'll note that if I select coastal processes here, the skip button is disabled because now I've already uh, selected a filter option. So if I wanted to skip that question entirely, I just have to unclick it and skip it. But for right now, I'm going to click Coastal Processes and go to Next. Um, and here I'm going to say I'm really interested in identifying vulnerabilities and adaptation. That's what I need help with. Um, so once I select that, I see now I'm at 11 of the 55 products that are matching the filtering criterias, criteria. So from here, I'm going to advance once more and I get my results. Um, I see the guided search results at the top. There are the filters that I've selected that are um, along the left-hand side, and we'll look at those in a moment. Um, and then here are the products, the, the 11 of the 55 products that met and matched this uh, selected criteria that I chose. I see number one is um, a, a portal, um, and another is a geonarrative. Let's just click on the geonarrative for a moment. Um, and here is the product summary page that I can look at. So I see what it's called. Um, I see some of the features uh, that uh, describe it. I see that there's a screenshot of um, what the geonarrative looks like. Uh, looks like. Um, the geonarrative, for those of you that might not be familiar, that's another word for a story map, um, which are really interactive mapping products that give you a lot of information. Um, so here I've, um, I, I can see much more what it looks like if I click on the um, tab itself or on the um, screenshot itself. I can also go directly to the product from this page and I can learn a lot more about what the product's about. Um, I can see the filtering criteria that are used and applied to this product. I see there's a list of contacts associated with the products. Um, and I see that there are some related products that might be interesting to me too, as well as a publication. So um, with all of that, I'm gonna go back to the guided search again. Um, and now let's um, pop open our filters. So I'm going to select the change filters option. And let's say um, in this case, I wanted to look a little bit more at the product types uh, that were the outcomes. So here I see model, portal, web application tool. I'm a little confused about what those things are. So here is where I might hover over this I, and it describes what those outcomes may, oh, what those product types might be. So for example, a model here, we're talking about a physical, conceptual, or mathematical representation of a system. A model output provides a product that uses different scenarios versus a tool, um, which is uh, used to carry out a particular function. So we've included those definitions. So if I were to select tool, now I see that there are only three products um, that are available in the search that meet these criteria. I also have some other filtering options, such as the output that the products come in, uh, the time scale that I might be interested in, again, with some hovering eye buttons to describe what we might mean by time scale there, as well as uh, thematically where these, um, where these might fit within um, the coastal hazard realm. 
Um, so that's a little bit more about um, our guided, a little bit about our guided search. Let's go back to, oh, I, two things I wanted to mention as well. One is that when I open the product summary, what I see is that it's opened in a new tab. This is, re this is a really nice feature because it means that the search um, that I conducted and the criteria that I applied are still preserved in this other window. So I can go back and look at more products this way. Okay, for now, I'm going to go back to the home page um, and go to the filtered search option. So this will look very similar uh, to what we were just seeing, um, but here I see I'm in the filtered search and I've got all 55 available products that match the selected filtering criteria available to me. Um, I see the sort order right now is in terms of best match. I haven't selected any criteria yet, so um, I'm going to as I select criteria, um, what this is going to do is show me some of the um, products that that bet, best match those criteria. And I also see that there's a pagination element, so I can um, advance to see um, the products. And this, this allows for a friendlier display, um, depending on what device um, you might be on. So um, if you're on a mobile device, for example, um, you're not endlessly scrolling unnecessarily. OK, so for here, um, let's again start with geographic scope. And I see there's another I button that includes a lot of the specific information that we read about earlier under the guided search that some national products may not cover every region, but still have the potential to support the full US and its territories. So for here, so for this, I'm going to select the East Coast, but I'm also maybe potentially interested in what's going on in Alaska. Um, I'm going to skip some of these other options, but I'm going to um, go to time scale, for example. Um, and again, I've got some hovering eyes that tell me um, what now, what past, and what future mean. I'm going to click all of these, for example, and just see where I land. And here I see I've, I've got the coastal change hazards portal that's showing up first. And um, this does indicate that it, it's a best match. So I'm going to click on this. I see a little bit more about the product summary where I can go to the product and I see that East Coast and Alaska are both part of um, the descriptive properties or criteria here, as well as the time scale, which encompasses the now, past and future. Again, this opened in its own separate tab, so I can go back to the filter search page. I can look at some others that are now alphabet uh, alphabetically available in terms of their best available. Um, and then I can uh, click on a different product, for example, and see that um, the product summary here um, matches some, but not all of the criteria. So this would not be um, necessarily the best match for the criteria that I, were, that I was employing, um, but still great to know that it's available. Um, and with that, I think I've um, demonstrated um, to you all um, many of the features that are available um, in the Navigator and how to use it. I'll um, point out one more element to it, which is that uh, this is intended to uh, be supported on multiple browsers um, and different displays. So if I were to um, shrink my window down. Hopefully you all are seeing what I'm seeing, which is that now my filter options are stacked on top of each other and I've got my product, um, my relevant products listed below. So with that, I'm going to stop the demonstration and um, stop sharing my screen and I will invite um, Amanda Stoltz to take us um, into the question and answer session. Thank you, Erica, for that great demonstration. I hope everyone is encouraged to check out the Navigator and see where it leads you. My name is Amanda Stoltz. I'm a social scientist at USGS, and some of you may remember me from the listening sessions that I conducted. In a moment, we're gonna start the Q&A session, so I'll ask those of you who have questions for us to either raise your virtual hand or put a question in the chat. But first, I'd love to introduce you to the rest of the steering committee on this project. Um, they're all here with us today and ready to answer any questions you might have. So other than Erica, Maya, and Don, who we met earlier, we also have Emily Himmelstos, Amanda Cravens, Marie Bartlett, Richard Snell, 
Meg Palmston, Legna Torres Garcia, and of course, everyone that we've met. So now I'd like to invite folks to go ahead and put questions in the chat or raise their hands. Uh, we just ask that we you unmute yourself before you ask your question. So while we're getting some of these questions in, I have a one for Erica that I'm sure everyone is interested in hearing about. Erica, what is next for the navigator? And I say, oh goodness, isn't the navigator enough? No, um, <laughs> just kidding. Uh, so this is, you know, as I said, this is in many ways uh, a public rollout of a product that we anticipate um, will continue to refine based on the feedback that we get from all of you um, as you continue to use and explore and, and engage with it. Um, you know, there are um, other elements that we've talk talked about in terms of displays and visioning. We have some um, conversations going on uh, to dip, uh, in, in developing partnerships, both within the federal family and outside, uh, to think more about how this um, fits within the scheme of all of the other um, information and coastal data information that's available to it. Um, but uh, again, there, there are lots of ideas, and um, at the same time, we're trying to stay tolerant with our ambiguity in terms of helping the user, having the user experience continue to guide us in terms of what the needs are and, and what may come next. So, that um, does anyone else in the steering committee want to offer anything before I change gears? And with silence, I assume <laughs> that everybody is satisfied with that answer. That was a great answer. It looks like we have a question from Maggie. Maggie, could you go ahead and um, unmute yourself and ask your question? Sure. Thank you so much. And this this is such an amazing tool. I'm also really happy to hear that you use design thinking to create it. Um, I want to uh, offer uh, another level of user experience. Um, we are just standing up an alliance for the Mystic River watershed here in southeastern Connecticut. And um, our goal is to involve the community in the planning of the watershed plan, a comprehensive watershed plan. So putting the power of design in the hands of people. So instead of designing for them, designing with them and trying to break the usual planning paradigm of plan and design, present and defend, um, and really engage people in it from the beginning. So if you would like, we could, I could offer the Alliance as a, as a kind of test group to see how citizen scientists can access uh, USGS. I think it's really exciting. And I, I think they'll be able to do it. Um, they, they'll learn some new vocabulary in the process, but it might be interesting feedback for you and I'm happy to try to gather that. I'm nodding right now, and I, but I shouldn't nod without turning to our social scientists on the pro project and asking them what they, for their thoughts. So Amanda, Amanda, or Dawn would love to hear your reactions, or Maya. Yeah, I'd love to direct this to uh, Amanda Cravens, if you'd like to talk a little bit more about the human-centered design vision that we had for this project and what that looks like. Um, thank you for the question. I think that's a really exciting direction and I think we'd love to to hear more about it. I think that we've definitely thought about user communities as one of the ways we can take this forward. Exactly who those communities are and, and what makes sense is probably a longer conversation than we have time for today, but I love the idea and I really appreciate, um, yeah, I appreciate that you're thinking in the same direction. Yeah, thank you so much, Maggie. It looks like we have another uh, question in the chat from Rose. They said, this is fantastic. How were the resources chosen out of so, so many USGS products that are available? And how will the team decide which resources to add in the future? Uh, I can take that one and others are welcome to add to it. Um, thanks Rose for the feedback and for the question. Um, you know, honestly, um, 
when we started out um, designing uh, the navigator, we we kept it small um, because that was part of the keeping it simple. So we worked with about 29 products initially that we knew kind of covered a good gambit of um, the information that we had within our coastal and marine sciences program. Um, from there, um, we um, we actually just um, tested um, and evaluated our process for adding new products to the navigator. So we did put out a call um, a couple months ago for um, any additions that folks felt like were ready um, and would be um, good to feature in the navigator. And um, we gave folks a form, a form to fill out um, internally. Um, and those data are, and those products were added to the navigator in the last few weeks. We anticipate we'll be updating the navigator quarterly. We do have a curation team in place as well as a process in place to add new products. So it should stay current. And because we've kept it simple, it is a fairly simple um, integration of new products. So we anticipate having the bandwidth and the capacity to be able to support the, um, the navigator moving forward, which is always a question with some of these tools. You know, what will it will it stay current? Um, and here we are assured that uh, it will. Thanks, Erica. While we're waiting to get some more questions from the audience, I have another follow-up question for you. Is the Navigator just for USGS products or will non-USGS products be added to the Navigator? Um, currently, and this has to do with that first um, question that um, Amanda posed to me. Currently, the navigator is intended to serve USGS products. That's not to say that that might not change, but um, we identified that we really needed to create um, out of the gates something that could serve um, to aggregate our own USGS resources. So moving forward, I think those are conversations that we um, very much anticipate having with others um, and other resources that um, that might um, that we need to figure out how to um, point to um, and um, provide. So it, it's some it's a much larger conversation. Um, but one that uh, I think we'll be looking to have as we continue to advance the navigator. Great, thank you. And it looks like Amanda Cravens would like to add to that as well. Please. Oh, no, not so much to add to it. I just wanted to make sure that you saw we do have a question, it looks like from Carolyn Ruffel that's a little bit up. I can read it if that would be helpful. Um, Carolyn says, this is a great and clearly so such a huge amount of effort. Um, one, this has been formulated to bring together everything that um, the program produces in this space, which has a role, of course. On the other hand, can one come up with a curated product that shows the best possible information, data, or model? There are times when that is needed and your judgment as scientists would be helpful. Two, also we serve different constituencies. This is terrific for many users, but we also provide high-level scientific input to other agencies. Will there be a separate way to address their needs among the many? not necessarily conflicting data sets and products. Congratulations again to the team. Great I question. <laughs> yeah, go ahead, Eric. Great questions. I was going to ask Amanda if you wanted to start with this um, and I can follow on. Um, Amanda Cravens, sorry. Yeah, I. I think that that curation piece is really important. You're calling out something there. I tend to think of decision support as not just the software, the product, what, uh, you know, the navigator here, but as something that can build relationships. And I think that's something that we're really hoping. When I, with previous research that I've done with, um, these sorts of products in other contexts, they can really be a way for those of us within um, USGS to connect with people who are interested in the information. So one of the things is that each of these products has a contact for the information. And so if 
you see something that you're interested in, there's a person to reach out to to learn more. Or if there's a couple of information products and it's not clear how to make use of them or which might be the most appropriate information or data to be using for the particular task you're trying to do or decision you're trying to make, we've tried to provide you with a way to get to contact someone who might be able to help you. And if you have ideas for how that kind of relationship building function might be improved, we'd love to hear about them because I think that is something we're, we're really interested in and think is important. And I can take the second part of that question. Thanks, Amanda. Um, in terms of the different constituencies, um, Carolyn, I think you know that really comes back to the target audience, and I think we we identified researchers as one uh, group, um, but I think they're uh, the thing that the team really um, realized as we were um, working with this list of five is that each of these users had more specific and detailed needs, um, and um, potential other products that could better meet their needs. So the navigator met um, in broad brush um, the, a lot of the needs that were expressed among these five groups. But I think um, for the research category or any of those others listed, there is a, a much more detailed um, effort that could um, that could be explored to develop even more specific um, products um, and resources um, to meet their needs. And that's something that, you know, I think we're we're grappling with is, you know, where and, and why we landed on the navigator um, as a first cut, because that this allowed us to meet kind of that that larger need across um, multiple users, um, but there's clearly more work to be done. We've got a lot of data to support it now. Um, and so the question is where we turn next, and, and that's something we're, we're really trying to decide with the resources and the capacity that we have at hand. Thank you so much, Eric and Amanda. I have another question in the chat before we're going to go to a raised hand. Sydney has a great question. Uh, they ask, what other federal agencies are you most interested in speaking with about collaborations or integrations? And have any agencies reached out to you? Amanda Stoltz, I'm gonna turn that one back to you. Oh, sure. So <laughs> in the listening sessions, when I told folks USGS is interested in your needs as coastal data users, one of the first questions we often got was, well, you know, are you working with NOAA? Are you working with FEMA? Are you working with these other federal agencies? Are you working with NPS? And I'm really glad to say that the answer is yes. And we have been working to make sure that the um, the navigator, as well as any products we produce in the future, are going to add capacity instead of redundancy. Uh, so really just working to be as inclusive as possible with our federal family and beyond in um, the creation of these products and hoping to continue collaborating as we continue this effort to make our science more actionable and more accessible. So I hope that answers your question. Um, we'll go to the raised hand, uh, Pallavi, when you go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question. Thanks, Amanda. Um, I'm Pallavi Mande, and I'm uh, calling in from Brookline, Massachusetts. And I have a two-part question, um, mostly for you, Erica, since you are sort of part of this geography. Um, one is to do with, uh, you know, uh, granularity of data, uh, and the other has to do with um, sort of governance issues. So. The first, um, I would just frame in the sense of, you know, uh, the state, as you know, of Massachusetts has been um, leading the charge on, you know, providing data that is uh, consistent across the board. And so, you know, different municipalities uh, don't have, you know, different data sets. So that, that's been a great, um, issue that has been resolved over time, uh, but we still 
do have needs. When I say we, I, I'm just talking about the broader community uh, dealing with clo uh, coastal resilience uh, planning um, to kind of go back and forth in terms of how how much detail we need for data available. And I guess it, I just wanted to kind of understand from you how what you are providing as part of this navigator interfaces with what maybe the state of Massachusetts has um, been putting out as uh, data that any consultant or community can use um, for their own analysis? Well, that's a big question and a great one. Um, so what I can tell you is this. Um, our program um, is national in scale in terms of our USGS um, Coastal and Marine Hazards and Resources Program. So, you know, we often work at more of a hyper local level, um, you know, to better understand uh, coastal change um, and what drives it. Um, and then we we scale up and out. Um, so a lot of what is captured in the navigator is what we have currently. So it's that snapshot of information that we have across our program, mm -hmm. um, knowing those things. So some of these um, products are regional in nature, some of them are more localized in nature, um, and some of them are um, more part of this national scale effort. In terms of getting granular, I mean, I think, I think, and we know, and I think if we haven't linked to the um, listening sessions report in the chat, this would be a great time to do so. Uh, this is information that that we know users need, um, and certainly within the state of Massachusetts. And so this helps to inform the information that we've gathered as part of this product, helps to inform the research and the products that we produce moving forward. So, you know, some of these products that are in the navigator currently may speak to some of your needs, um, but we've also done a larger effort as part of this in gathering information and better understanding what we need to do to, to continue to provide relevant scientific information and inform um, what we are delivering um, to uh, the users across the country. So it's not as specific an answer as I think you would like, um, but I can tell you we've learned a lot from this process and this information is being used in a variety of different ways to inform how we move forward. No, that's really helpful. Thank you for that. And I sure. I, I guess I could just, uh, for my second question, maybe offer a qualifier. Um, sorry about that. Um, so in terms of governance, uh, as as you know, you know, we have um, the Commonwealth uh, has a lot of uh, um, decision making power at a local level. Um, and we are we, we typically kind of um, leverage what we can get for resources at the state level uh, and use it at a local level. But if you think about you know decision making around climate resilience, a lot of those kinds of um, decisions are actually needed at a regional level. And I was wondering, you know, this could be just a Massachusetts problem, or or, or more a Massachusetts problem than other uh, places that have some form of a regional governance structure. But have you um, specifically incorporated? Um, feedback from watershed associations, which in my view are sort of as close as we can get to regional thinking, at least from the perspective of, um, you know, land water uh, interface. And I I heard another, I guess, uh, watershed person come on uh, before me talking about uh, citizen science and, and their, you know, giving the data or the power to the citizens to make their own um, to do their own planning, but um, what are your thoughts about um, 
potential governance structure conversations that can be had based on what this tool provides? Um, well, I might turn parts of your question back to our social scientists, particularly Amanda Stoltz, who interviewed a number of people. But what I can tell you is this. The, Nav the Navigator does include a number of regional products that were developed in response to regional scale needs. For example, there's one product within the Navigator um, that uh, I know intimately, which is why I'm mentioning it. There are others um, that um, that was developed in response to the National Park Service um, who mm -hmm. had a geoarchaeology need. They needed to better understand coastal resources across their coastal national parks mm -hmm. um, that were vulnerable or threatened, threatened by erosion or other coastal hazards. And so uh, what was produced were um, maps of, um, you know, it, it, what we're calling the coastal change likelihood or a snapshot of where coast uh, where the coast is most likely to change over the next 10 years. We did not just dial this into parks. We took this as an opportunity to um, provide this at the regional scale. So from Maine to Virginia. Um, up to 10 meters um, inland. Um, and so it's comprehensive, it's fairly detailed, um, and is one of the many products that are featured um, in the Navigator. There are others for uh, the Gulf Coast in California, similarly. Um, so um, that's where the Navigator is helpful in terms of an aggregation space for you to find those things um, a bit better. So does, hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, the only thing I would add yes, is that thank you. initially, oh yeah, so yeah, initially, you know, we thought who are the the coastal stakeholders or the groups of folks that were interested in providing information for, and initially we thought, oh, well, the public, we want to design for the public, but we're, we, we realized pretty soon on that that's a very um, difficult group to try to pin down. I mean, we're talking about a whole mass of different diverse ways that the public are interacting with data um, and kind of drilling down on what that term means and better providing this information to who we consider the public is kind of a next step in this progress as well. And we have a question from. Uh, but, but can I add, can I add yeah. to that as well? Um, you know, I, I think there was a question in there about translating dis science into decision making. And this is definitely providing data information science, but that link in the report, there's some examples about some of the ways that specifics of things like spatial format of data or temporal um, temporal scale at which information is available might translate into specific decision making needs that folks like you or others are grappling with. There's an example in there about how California was grappling with how do, do they set sea level rise projections at a specific point in time or do they use probabilistic models of those? And so I think that that translation process, as you're grappling with it, the details of what kind of information is available at spatial scale and temporal and kinds of information and projections, all of those details are places that I, I think USGS can help. So do maybe take a look at the, some of the detailed analysis in that report and then reach out if there's other ways we can help you think through that. But I think that translation might be helpful to your question as well. Thanks for that added context, Amanda. Uh, we have a question from a geologist from Sudan, Shiraz. Uh, their question in the chat is, is this information freely available on USGS? Yes. yes. It's all freely available. It's all publicly available and accessible. Great. And we had another question from Maggie. Is, are we able to save our searches and a response from Richard or developer in the chat that that's one of the functionalities that we're working on? Just more evidence that this is very iterative process and we're just adding as much capacity to the tool, especially as folks tell us about more things that they want to see. 
So with that, I think I'll pass it over to Don to close us out. Thank you everyone for your wonderful questions and uh, America, um, Erica and Amanda for your answers. Thank you, Amanda, Erica, and Amanda. Um, and thank you all for taking the time to learn about the Navigator with us. Feel free to explore the Navigator for yourself at this first link. Um, to read more about the listening sessions at the second link. To email our team with follow-up questions or comments um, at the third link down at the bottom. And then to sign up for updates at the QR code or the link on the right side. So you can get updates about our products development and when new um, information is available. Um, the recording of this will also be posted to our webpage. And when it is, we'll send it out to our attendees. Um, and with that, I would like to say thank you to everyone and have a wonderful afternoon, morning, depending on. Um, what time time zone you're currently in. <laughs>